My father was born 37 years after the war between the states was over. Now it's hard to conceive of long periods of time, even when I was a senior in high school, I could not picture a hundred years. Now that I'm 74 years old, I'll be 75 next month, it's easier because I've lived three quarters of a century. Now, one more quarter of a century would make me a hundred years old. Let's face it, I may not make it. But I know where I'm going when I leave this life, so I'm not worried about it. I'm not afraid of going to heaven. I just ain't in no big hurry to leave. Because I've got three sons, I've got three daughters-in-law, and I've got six grandchildren. And one of them is at the house, was at the house when I left a while ago, and he's only five years old. And I'd love to, to hang around and coach him, tell him things that I'm going to share with you all today when he's on up in years. And he'll probably be a lot taller than me someday. His dad is that much taller than I am and has been most of his life. But my father, who was a dairy farmer in West Kentucky, I'm not a native Tennessean, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. But I am proud to be a Kentucky. <laughs> I, 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 I told them several times, I was very fortunate, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, which happens to be the capital of the Confederacy, so I got to see a lot of history when I was growing up. So we're not native Tennesseans either, so it's okay. I've never spent the time in Richmond I'd love to. I just in North Northern Virginia. Yeah. But I have been to every battlefield in the state of Tennessee. Yeah. Most of them in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and several in Kentucky. But uh, my father was born in 1897. And he personally knew about a, about 20 Confederate veterans. Yeah, part of Kentucky during the war between the states, and I don't call it a civil war, I call it a war between states. But <clears throat> part of Kentucky voted with the North, had feelings for the North. Part of Kentucky, especially the western tip of Kentucky, where I was raised, was very Confederate, very pro-Southern. So the state of Kentucky was torn. There was a lot of strife. The whole war was a war, and you probably heard it in the presentation you've been listening to. The whole war was a war of father against son brother against brother, cousins against cousins, neighbors against neighbors. And a war or a feud of that type often results in hatred. This day and time, I see all kinds of evidence that people dislike each other too much. We're all brothers in the sight of our maker. And we're all equal in his sight. It doesn't matter whether you're boys or girls, whether you're black or white or yellow or red. We're all brothers in the sight of our maker. But since Dad knew so many Confederate soldiers, he was a born-again rebel. He was a Southerner from the word get-go. Three of the men that I count as, that I have as ancestors were Confederate soldiers. One was a man that was married to a great aunt. He wasn't my blood relative, but he was my relative by marriage. And these men Dad knew very well they listened, uh, he listened to their stories, 
and why they were willing to leave home and fight for something they believed in. Has everybody in here got a refrigerator in the house? A stove? Probably a microwave? A television? A computer? Yeah, we all most of us have those things, and we think we need them. But imagine if you had none of those items. You had to use a kerosene lantern or a coal oil lantern, they call it coal oil instead of kerosene, or candles to light your, your cabin, your very primitive, simple little house. What if you didn't have a refrigerator, you didn't have a microwave, how would you cook a meal? <laughs> how do you think they do that? Uh, light a fire. What would you build that fire? Rocks and some wood. In a, in a fireplace. <clears throat> um, or a stove. There was such a thing as cast iron stoves that they could put a, a pot of beans or a pot of whatever, but just think there were no beanie weenies. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not sure I was good. <laughs> I mean, you can do There was no soup in a can. There was no, well, there were, were not even any tin cans as we know tin cans. Food was dried primarily, beans, peas uh, were dried and kept that away. Corn was dried and made into hominy, which, anybody know what hominy is? Nobody knows what hominy is. Have you eaten hominy, darling? I like it. My mama, mama made hominy from white corn, and I've eaten it many times. My wife, my wife <clears throat> cannot make hominy, <laughs> and I don't have the knowledge to teach her. But life in those days, as we know it, was hard. Everybody in the family, from age three or four years old up, worked. Have you got a job after school? Do you feed the dog? Do you? <laughs> it's good to have responsibilities. <laughs> I love cats, and I know men are not supposed to love cats. But my wife, my wife had a dog for years, and I had a cat. And the dog didn't like me, and the cat didn't like her. <laughs> well, they were both fond of us and not the other one. But life in those days were hard. It was hard. You had to work hard to make a living. You had to work hard to just have something to eat. Can you imagine no hot dogs? You couldn't go to the grocery and get a piece of beef that's called a steak or a package of ground up pork called sausage. Everybody had to kill their own meat and save it. You would have had to help skin and take care of the calf or the hog or the chicken that you all raised in order to have something to eat. Question. What's a cat? A baby cow. A calf, C A L L. Calf. That's all right. Anybody's got a question, you don't understand something I'm, I'm talking about, you just ask. If I can't answer it, I'll tell you I can't. Yes, sir. And you would also have to um, hunt, um, you also have to like, kill buffalo and stuff in order to have the fur in order to get blankets. Well, wild game was an important source food in those days and there was a lot more wild game because there weren't near as many people and as many fields and as many houses and so forth. Yeah. Are you talking about if you what you raise you eat? Yep. That's right. And I still do that. I've got a big garden. I've got a, a little John Deere tractor that uh, was brand new in 1959 
that I garden with. It goes put, 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 put. That kind of gun thing. Question. Uh, do you do eggs? Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. what lays the eggs. <laughs> I've gathered up but any what, of eggs. What he's saying, guys, is back then, you didn't get in your car and drive to Walmart. There was no Walmart. So if you wanted to eat, you had to grow it, you had to kill it, you had to skin it, you had to do everything for it. So whatever you had to eat, you did. Okay? It's not something you, there wasn't any can openers or frozen peas or frozen foods. No frozen pizza, there wasn't dominoes you could call. It's all up to you. Okay? So what you ate is what you grew or what you killed or what you raised. Okay? Do I, do I need to wrap this up at a quarter to one? Yes, sir. I was checking my memory. Yes. Um, let me uh, let me go on with, with stuff about the war. I mentioned Dad knew about 20 Confederate veterans, and four of them, kept my uncle by marriage, four of them were his ancestors. One of them was what Dad called Pa Croft, his grandfather. And Pa Croft and one and my uncle that Dad called Uncle Jeff and Uncle Dick were in the cavalry. But when I decided to give school programs and, and uh, do my boy services and dress as a Confederate soldier, I chose a uniform that's a cavalry uniform. Now why would this be cavalry? First off, it's gray, the most common gray that they, they used for uniforms, the Confederate Army used for uniforms, was about this color. The yellow cuffs, the yellow sash, the yellow sergeant stripes, the hat cord, all are cavalry colors. Now, for men that were in the artillery, in the, what did I say? Artillery. What is artillery? Exactly. Yes, sir. The uh, artillery members had red cuffs, and red sashes, and red stripes, and hat cords. And if you were in the infantry, now what's the infantry? That's right. The men in the cavalry, you know what they call the infantry? The ground pounders. Because <laughs> they had to walk. Everywhere they went, they walked. And a man in the cavalry, he might go two or three days without a hot meal. The cavalry moved fast, traveled a whole lot, especially if they rode with General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And the three men that I just talked about rode with Nathan Bedford Forrest. And if you get a, I'm going to call it what it is. My dad taught me a valuable lesson. He taught me a lot of valuable lessons. One of them is that there ain't no substitute for the truth. And I lied to him one time. I was a pretty good sized boy. And he knew I was lying and guess what he did? He beat the tar out of me with a big wide belt, combine belt. It was a dry belt off a of Minneapolis Moline combine. He cut a piece about that long, put a wood handle on it, and we used it to load hogs, feeder pigs, into a, a trailer when we carried them to market. And he whipped me with that. And that's the worst whipping I guess I ever got. But I deserved it. I told him a lie. And he told me over and over, before and after. There ain't no substitute for the truth. And that applies to today's generations just as it did to me. You've got to be responsible for your actions. And a lot of people try not to be this day and time. Not just young people, not just second graders. I'm talking about ninth graders and twelfth graders, college students, and young adults don't want to accept responsibility for their actions. And somewhere they've missed 
learning what my father taught me. But I was talking about me in a poem. Now I know you can't see from where you are, but I've got Kentucky buckles on. I mean buttons on, and I've got a Kentucky belt buckle. But this button was what what was commonly used in the state of Kentucky, uniforms made in the state of Kentucky, and it's got the great seal of the state of Kentucky on it. There are a lot of different styles of coat. Now this is called a frock coat, and it's kind of dressy. Most soldiers didn't have anything this fancy, but I wanted to honor my ancestors when I had this made, and I had the, the pattern, the design, the looks of this coat were made according to a pattern from 1860, from a pattern that's existed since the Great War between the states. So it's accurate in every detail. My pants are accurate in every detail. Not these now. Remember, this is my jogging shorts. I got a big scar on this knee where they operate on it, and I can't stand wool trousers rubbing that scar now. So I had to stay with these jogging shorts. Our paint. But uh, everything in my uniform is accurate. It looks the way it did back in the 1860s. I, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm and I was in the 4-H club starting at age 10. You had to be 10 then. I expect you still got to be 10 years old to join the 4-H club. Well, my first project I raised a beef calf, fed him good, and trained him to lead and, and to stand right and so forth. And that's why I have this cane. I used that when I was showing cattle. I just punched the cow on her foot and she had her feet like this. I wanted her to stand like she's supposed to, where she, she'd look the best or eat. So uh, I used that cane the last time in 1960 and I didn't, I didn't pick it up hardly until right after my operation and I needed a, a walking stick. But uh, I saw my 4-H calf in 1950 something. Let's see, I was born in 43. It was about 1953. And I got to keep the money that I made from my 4-H calf. And I'll tell you what, I was the richest man in Babylon. There's a book by that, by that title, a wonderful little book, Richest Man in Babylon. But I, I'll never forget the title. But uh, I was a rich boy because I had $158. <laughs> but my dad had told me that when I sold my first 4 inch calf, I could buy a saddle mare, a horse. And he heard of one up at a little community called Pilot Oak, Kentucky. We went up there one day after dinner. He had me get out and knock on the door. The man came to the door and I told him who I was and what I was looking for. He said, I got just what you need. Come on around back. And we went around behind his house. And I was 10 years old. You all are eight, seven, eight, nine, yeah, in that eight, well, I wasn't much older than you all are and wasn't much taller than any of you are. I couldn't see over the top rail of that three rail fence, but I could see between the second and the third rail. And I looked through there, and there was the biggest, prettiest horse I ever laid eyes on. The horse, the mare, had belonged to this man's daughter. And she named that mare Baby Doll. <laughs> and I never changed her name. But she was taller, that much taller to the shoulders than I was. But all I could see was a color called Blood Red Sorrel. And horsemen know what Blood Red Sorrel is. And she had four white feet and white stockings. You know, the bottom part of her legs were white, all four of them. And she had a big white blaze down her face, big long uh, sorrel tail and mane. 
and she was beautiful. And the man had told me what he wanted for, and I knew I'd have eight dollars left when I paid him for my saddle man. And Dad talked to him a minute and said, Well, son, I know where there's another one. You want to go look at it? I said, No, Daddy, that's just what I want. And I had a little trouble teaching her who was boss. But I did one day. <laughs> she knew I was afraid of her. Now, if you're ever around a horse, are you you're around one, son? I can't hear you, darling. Uh, well, if you're ever around one much, and they know you're afraid, and you're afraid of them, they're smart animals. They will know you're afraid of them. And I was afraid of baby dog. I mean, Dad, I didn't have a saddle. Now, he bought me one in a, in a few days. He bought me a saddle and bridle and all. <clears throat> but the stirrup on the saddle, when he put it on her, I couldn't put it on her. I wasn't tall enough. When he put the saddle on that mare, the stirrup came right about here on me. And even with two good legs and being 10 years old, I couldn't get my foot four feet off the ground. <coughs> so I had to ride her up to the barn and climb the barn wall, and which was lattice. You know, I had a gap, had a gap about that size, and then a board about that size, and you know, you climb the stable wall, and that's how I had to get on her. But she knew I was afraid of her because I was, and I got tired of her annex her misbehaving, and I taught her who was boss one Sunday afternoon. And from that day forward, Baby Doll wanted to do what I wanted to do. She was the greatest saddle wire anybody could have ever had. She was big, she was heavy, her feet were bigger than most saddle mares, saddle horses. Oh, how many of you know what the Budweiser Club Clydesdales look like? You seen the, the bear wagon with the big giant horses laid on? They've got the, they've got the feet that they're, they've got the fur that is oh, fur and the yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're that's what horses. she was. She was half Clydesdale mm. and half Mustang, whatever that is. But, uh, when I was, was uh, when, I, when I taught her who was boss and, got, and really enjoyed riding the horse, I got an old stirrup out of the gear room there at the barn off a saddle that was, well, I think the saddle was gone. It was just an extra stirrup. And I took a hamstring, which is a leather strap, oh, about that long, about yay wide, and I took that hamstring and put through the bottom of the stirrup on the saddle and then through the second stirrup to where it hang about that far down and I could get my foot in that bottom stirrup and just literally climb up on her back without riding to a stump or a barn or whatever to get off. My favorite game was not playing cowboy and Indian. I didn't play cowboy and Indian and I had the biggest horse in Hickman County probably, Hickman County, Kentucky. I played rebel soldier. I didn't have a uniform, especially not anything this nice. But in the summertime, I usually didn't wear anything but a pair of cut-off Levi's, was barefooted. Didn't have a shirt on much of the time. Well, except on Sundays or if I went to town. But when I was on the farm, that's the way I was dressed. But I wanted a hat and a sword bad. My dad paid a whole dollar and a quarter, maybe a dollar and a half for a straw hat at the Purina feed store where he bought cow feed, hog feed and all. And I caught one of my mother's Dominecker roosters and jerked a tail feather or wing feather out and stuck it in my hat. This one, that's an ostrich plume, the tip of an ostrich feather. I didn't have anything that fancy either. 
Oh, I didn't explain. All of these brass pieces on here mean something. My ancestors that rode with Forrest were in the 12th, 12 12th Kentucky Cavalry. This is a Celtic cross. My ancestors were Irish and Scotch, and they would have had great reverence for a Celtic cross. My ancestors were in Company C of the 12th Kentucky Cavalry, and the cross swords mean that I was in the cavalry. Well, that's a cavalry symbol. I've got a pelican on this side of my hat. Does anybody know what state has the state bird of a pelican? Yeah. <laughs> that, I understand why you would think that. I lived in Louisiana 17 years, and all three of my sons were born in the great state of Louisiana. So I decided, since it was their birthplace, I'd put that pelican on my hand. But uh, I had a question. It's, it's, part, it's part of the ostrich feather. It's part of the ostrich feather. Yeah, it's all the same. You know what an ostrich is, that a big bird of Africa? Yeah. Okay. I, uh, question. I've got boobies in there. I don't know. <laughs> it's already time for me to quit. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you one thing. I've got time. Well, it's just a little. Uh, oh, and I've got a bag, an envelope of Confederate money. This, hear how hard that is? That was what a lot of soldiers back during the Great War of Northern Destruction, the Great War between the states, that was common food. It was flour and water, water <coughs> mixed and cooked usually on a, in a skillet on an open fire. It's called hardtack. That one, I wouldn't eat it all because it's been in here with all kinds of stuff. I have eaten them, and it would take a man, it'd take a man an hour to chew that up and swallow. Well, he could enjoy at least some plain flour bread. That's all they had a lot of time. Uh, one of the stories, I got to tell this one. One of the stories that they had a few ears of corn in their ha haversack or in their saddlebag, and they stood there and fed that horse corn. And you may have never seen a horse eat corn off the cob, but when it bites that corn off the cob, grains fall out of its mouth. Well, the soldiers picked that corn up, washed it off, put it in a skillet, and had parched corn, field corn, for supper. And that might be all they have for two or three days. Because they were waging war, and war is hard. Uh, I'll quit. Uh, now, if you need a, a, an eight-hour program next time, just, just let me know. <laughs> uh, I've been studying. I've got probably, I'm pushing 300 books. Most of them written by Southern Law. And the, the greatest difference I've got in probably the program that you, you've been showing them is the reason the war was fought. Only seven out of a hundred people in the South in 1860 owned a slave. Seven out of a hundred. That would be, be equivalent of two in this room. The rest of you would have been non-slave owners. Do well, you think people that were not slave owners would fight and suffer and starve to protect slavery? They didn't like slavery because the slaves grew corn and cotton and tobacco and wheat. 
hogs and cows and the slave the products of slaves grew were sold in competition with what the farmers grew. So the fact that it was all about slavery is a Yankee lie. If it wasn't about slavery, why was the war fought? Oh. Every war that's ever been fought, whether it's the Scottish against the Picts, the French against the English, or who, thank you. Every war that's ever been fought by man is fought over territory, land, and the reason you want to rule land is to rule the people. And when you rule the people, you can levy and uh, taxes and collect money. Every war is over the root of all evil. Yes. No. I, I wish I could tell you that, but then my dad told me not to lie. <laughs> this is a, a copy of a $2 bill. And when you all file out, I've, I've been, I'm over five minutes. Would you all file out of the room? If you'll come by, I certainly would like to give you everybody. What do you say?